It's on now. Yes. Thank you. I enjoyed that very much. My name is Joan Gibson. I'm an old timer from here. Uh, for 15 years, I founded and directed the uh, Health Sciences Ethics Program at the University of New Mexico, and we spent a lot of time working on the legal and ethical dimensions of capacity and competence. Great. In New Mexico, our law is competent means or incompetent means has been determined by a court of law uh, not to be able to make certain decisions. Capacity is simply a functional assessment, yeah. which in our law uh, pretty much mirrors the 1983, which in the US, as you know, is when the President's Commission came out with its um, informed consent uh, criteria. And like you, it maps uh, essentially three dimensions. The ability to um, take in and process information. The second, and, and this is the part where I wanted to ask you a question. The second is to uh, be able to have and in some way articulate a system of values or meanings that form the premise on which the decision is based does in fact your decision flow from information that came in and your value system, which may not be uh, the value system of the clinical psychiatrist. To that end, we develop a values history process and form which has been used functionally to um, teach people how to have a conversation with friends and family uh, to articulate what matters to them because they're the experts in that uh, bit of information. So I'm interested, number one, in how you um, initiate and make space for that conversation about meaning, which yeah. only the person, her, himself uh, can supply to you. Second, I would simply caution that consent in the research environment and consent in the treatment environment are different, yeah. even though we have conflated uh, the relationship between a subject and a researcher is quite different from the relationship between a patient and a practitioner. Yes. And I think those relationships right. matter a great deal. Finally, when I make a decision with my husband present, and my capacity is pretty much the same. It may be one thing. When my daughter is there, it may be another. And when my physician or nurse practitioner is there, it might be there yet again a different decision. Mm -hmm. So those situational contextual elements, I think, are absolutely essential to any kind of research or practice in this area. I thoroughly enjoyed your talk. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, those are all uh, interesting, important questions and some useful leads uh, for me. Uh, so let me just pick out a few things from that, and maybe we can continue the discussion later. Uh, as it have, I mean, I didn't talk about this just now, um, uh, but uh, this question about who's the experts on your values and who's the experts on what's good for you, actually. These are, are in what's in your interests. Um, this is right now the, the, the hot spot um, in the UK uh, about this. Uh, so suppose we find that you're lacking competence, you're lacking capacity. What happens then, right? Before you had these absolute rights, but now what happens is various other people have duties of best interest care, yeah? Um, and the law, I didn't put this up, but the law also defines best interest care. But again, it's in this lawyerly, quite schematic way. Uh, and over the last couple of months, there have been uh, contradictory rulings in the Court of Protection uh, about, uh, about just what that means. Uh, so there are different ways you can think about that question, right? One is what the lawyers call substituted decision making. Right now, you don't have capacity. But if you did have capacity now, this is the counterfactual model, what would you have chosen? And there, there, so there's one important case, this S case, that really is all, the whole testimony in the case is all organized around that. The judge is trying to find out what she would have decided if she had capacity. Uh, and then you get a ruling. Uh, there are very few appeals on a lot of these cases because often the procedures happen right away. There's no point in an appeal. The, uh, 
in the other, uh, in, but then there's another ruling where the judge has explicitly said that is the wrong question to ask, and he has argued, this is this S versus S case, uh, that a best interest standard is an objective standard, um, and that's what we ought to be finding out, and you specifically should not be asking this substitutive question. Uh, so, you know, suppose you're a heroin addict. If you'd had capacity right now, you would have chosen for more heroin, but that is not in your best interest. So that's one. Right now, that's waiting for a ruling about what's going to happen with that. And actually, law just says you're supposed to take into account the preferences of the individual. It doesn't say how you're supposed to take into account. So that's a real conundrum. Another part of this, anybody who's been in the EU recently knows health and safety regulations have gone berserk. But again, that's a form of reasoning that's very familiar. And so when people ask what's in the best interests of somebody, often that gets switched into where are they safest. And so you get these very, very difficult cases where you get this choice, this is what one judge is called the safe but miserable outcome, right? It may, if it, you make you, the best interest turns out locking you up in some safe environment. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, some of them are cases where that means protecting you from an abusive spouse, for instance. You get beaten up every now and then, but all the kind of sources of meaning in your life are in that world. So these are some of the dilemmas that are there. You're quite right about the treatment and research. There's a MATCAT R as well, and there's a MATCAT FP, fitness to plead. They're basically gen, uh, generalizing that, that same approach. Jerry. I don't hear you. I hear you, but yeah. Just Hello? Go oh. <laughs> yeah, so um, I want to, I want to, of course, there's been a lot of discussion about medical paternalism. Yes. And uh, patient autonomy. And there seem to me uh, elements um, in medical situation and context that um, undermine or, or obscure patient autonomy that, you know, your presentation didn't cover. And I just want to bring them to your attention and see how you respond to them. Y your third category under phenomenology was identity. So I don't know yeah. what you want to say about that. But that comes, that plays a very strong role in patients who basically uh, have an identity in medical, con medical context, which uh, leads them to trust the physician's judgment. So they may say, I mean, they're competent, I'm deciding, what I'm deciding is to trust the physician and choose the course of treatment, whatever course of treatment the doctor recommends. Mm -hmm. That's a very pervasive phenomena. Mm -hmm. Is that an exercise of autonomy? or a limitation, a violation of autonomy, how does that come into your picture? Good. Secondly, um, often what happens in medical situations uh, is that the categ your category of information is a problematic category. Mm -hmm. Because what physicians sometimes do is they present so-called information um, in a way that uh, generates a decision that would have been very different on the part of the patient if information had be, been presented in a different way. Mm -hmm. So one of the famous cases here is the long period when women with breast cancer were urged by their doctors to have a radical mastectomy. Mm -hmm. Then comes a period where lumpectomy, a much less disfiguring uh, operation, evidence is accruing that at least in a certain range of cases where there's no evidence of spread, mm -hmm. Lumpectomy may be, you know, just as effective mm -hmm. and far less disfiguring. Mm -hmm. But still, many physicians said, look, uh, trust me, the effect here of not having a mastectomy is uh, very probably to increase your, your chance of getting uh, cancer again, maybe without presenting the evidence of lumpectomy or presenting it in a way that really downplayed it. Mm -hmm. So information uh, yeah. is a category that phenomenologically may uh, be presented and emphasized in very different ways. Is, is that a violation of, uh, of autonomy if it's presented in a, in a, in a passionate way, one-sidedly passionate way? Yeah. How about that? Yeah. Then a third kind of case, which is trickier, we simply use the term information um, you know, as a sort of fixed category here. But as a matter of fact, one of the major um, problems with the exercise of patient autonomy is that uh, a lot of the information 
or information or evidence concerning the risks and benefits of treatment um, is not available, A, or B, not, not accessed by the physician. This has created one of the major movements in modern me medicine towards outcomes research and evidence-based medicine. So that, for example, you do research to see in how many cases uh, of um, surgery for an enlarged prostate, non-cancerous non enlarged prostate, in how many cases are there? What percentage are there over large populations? Are there the side effects of incontinence or impotence? Mm -hmm. Negative side effects of, of that surgery. And then, you know, when patients actually learn, how many would choose the surgery? So dr one thing dramatically uh, evidenced in this whole debate was that when doctors know and patients are actually given the information, far fewer of them choose surgery than has otherwise been the case. They're just not bothered enough yeah. by the uh, discomfort of enlarged prostate to want to take the risk of right. incontinence or impotence. Yeah. So that is, again, a very practical, uh, a very practical consideration that comes into play when we talk about patient autonomy over, over surgery decisions in uh, enlarged prostate. Yeah. So, Thanks, Jerry. Thanks. That's super rich. The, um, so I don't know if I can take up all that, but let me take up some bits of it. So look, I mean, one of the ways I want to go on this is, I mean, it's really the next step, if you accept my argument uh, that I kind of sketched out here, that capacity in most interesting cases is distributed in communities, uh, that really this question about autonomy is re a question in social theory. It's not, this is one of the reasons it seems to me the neuroscience misses it, because uh, it's really a question you've got to ask about the structure of the social relations. If capacity gets distributed, the question about whether you have capacity is about the structure of your decision community. So let me just introduce one of our cases that kind of bears on this. So the Mrs. A case uh, uh, was a ruling that came down last summer. Uh, so Mrs. A was a person in the bottom one percentile of IQ uh, in her, aid, her group. The, uh, and she had been under the care of social services quite a lot through most of her life. She was sexually active, and she twice became pregnant. Uh, and when she became pregnant, she carried the infant to term. Uh, she carried the baby to term, but the, uh, there was then an assessment as to whether she had mental capacity to care for the child. And it was found that she did not, and the child was removed from her uh, at, at birth in those two instances. Very traumatic experience. She doesn't even really understand what's going on. So social services, they want to find a way out of this. Um, and so they uh, uh, put her on uh, a monthly injection, contraceptive injection. Um, and she goes along with this. Um, she then meets Mr. A, who also is in the bottom one percentile of IQ for his group. And he objects to this. Um, the, uh, and he wants to, uh, her to come off of this. He complains she's interfering with their sex life. And whenever social services now come to the door, he answers the questions for her. He prevents them from seeing her alone. He prevents her from going off to college. They, she's in some adult education program. He doesn't want her to go there because she's getting access to social services there. He's basically shutting down her decision community. So she now says, to, well, she'll say to her friends or to some of these people she would see at college, she doesn't want to have a, a baby, but if you now ask her when Mr. A is around and when you ask her in open court, she says she does and she wants to get off of this. So, so the, 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 the council uh, go to court asking for an order to find her incapable of making a decision about contraception. Now, it's very interesting in that case. They didn't run a, I don't know that they ran a MACCAT T test, but from the transcript of the case, you can basically run it yourself. And it's pretty clear that she passes. She understands what contraception is. She can explain different methods and so on. She understands what the consequences are. She understands something, anyway, about how it's going to affect her life. There's a dispute. How much do you have to understand about what it's like to have a child in order to have capacity to take on? The, uh, but she, you know, she has a basic understanding of that she can express a choice. So the MACCAT T is going to give you a positive. This person looks, I mean, you're not supposed to say there's no pass threshold, but she scores high above the, the kind of what's become the kind of cutoff threshold. But in fact, Act, the judge in this case found that she did not have capacity. Uh, why? It was because of Mr. A, right? It wasn't anything to do with her individual cognitive performance. It had to do with the structure of her decision community. It's only when you widen your scope to bring that into view that you can, you can really get a, 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 an assessment, a meaningful assessment. Of what, I think the same kind of story applies uh, 
with some of the cases you're talking about. What you want to ask about is uh, what kind of decision community do I have with my psychiatrist, with my mental health advocate, with my family? How, and sometimes this is really an architectural question. What's the social architecture of the 